Welcome to the Chooser Her Story. Today's episode, Dr. Owen Emerson. So, hello, Owen. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be on your podcast. Thank you. I've obviously asked you on because you are an expert, in my opinion, on Amberlynn. Bless you. (laughs) So... But before we talk about Anne, because there's a lot to get through when it comes to Anne, I thought we could talk a little bit about you. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> so I was wondering, when did you first become interested in history? Do you know, it was a, a really early age and I have my wonderful mum, Sally Ann, to thank for my interest in history. In fact, my my love of history has sort of been germinated by many many different women over the years so I'm incredibly grateful to all of them but my mum was the the first and I was four years old it was back in 1988 just given my age away and we we left a family party and snuck off together back to our little cottage and we watched Anne of the Thousand Days together uh, a childhood favourite film of hers and she very much passed the baton on to me that day um, because I was completely transfixed. I, I don't know how much I comprehended of the, the narrative and the story line at four years old. It was probably more the fact that there were castles and beautiful costumes, but I was transfixed. In fact, I, I still have a very grainy picture of uh, Jean-Pierre Bujold as Anne Boleyn that my mum cut out of the newspaper for me that day. I, I still have it. So yes, that that was the, the beginning of my love of history and, and of Anne Boleyn, I guess. Amazing. So obviously we've covered where you began loving history and also Anne Boleyn at the same Indeed. time. It's <laughs> always an amazing story if you begin loving Anne Boleyn. She's the number one, yeah. Yeah, she's the number one. I talk about her daily, somehow. (laughs) But I was wondering, when did you decide, you know, like, I don't, like, just want this as a hobby. I want this as a career. That's a really great question. And it was actually probably much later than you might assume. I did fairly well at history in primary school and not too bad at secondary school but I never actually studied the Tudors until I got to A level. I was I was really unfortunate a lot of the, the year above me studied the Tudors and the year below me studied the Tudors at both primary and secondary school but I never got to and you know I'd really sort of really got stuck into certainly the six wives uh, by the time I was midway through primary school, my first history book was Alison Weir's Six Wives of Henry VIII, and I adored it. And then I got Antonia Fraser's Six Wives of Henry VIII. And I realised from quite an early age, I think, that there were differences. And I, I really wanted to get to the bottom of why Alison said one thing and why Antonia said the other. So I guess that was my first foray into historiography. And when I actually got to study the Tudors at A-level, I was kind of horrified that we had to do it through a textbook and that there was no opinion involved. It was just a regurgitation. You know, it was a very prescriptive way of of doing history. And by the time I got to A-levels, you know, I'd read Ives, I'd read Starkey. I, You know, there wasn't a book in existence that I hadn't already uh, read. And to my horror, my uh, Tudors, Peter <laughs> summed up uh, Anne as the whore um, and that was it that's all I got of Anne Boleyn and I I think I must have just rebelled because I did appallingly at A level in fact I failed my history A level and that kind of put a dampener I guess um, it meant that I didn't think I could then go on to university and in fact I didn't go to university till I was 25 so I tried my hand at the hospitality industry, uh, working in a lovely hotel. Uh, That very much confirmed that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. And I'm eternally grateful to the University of Sussex for allowing me to write an entrance essay. And also very grateful to the then curator, uh, the late Anna Spender, who um, allowed me to come to Heathrow 
uh, in order to prepare for this entrance essay. And um, I will forever be eternally grateful to her uh, for that opportunity. So yeah, that's that's when I got to, to really studying history in the way that I, I really wanted to and needed to. And it was really thanks to Professor Lucy Robinson at Sussex University and Professor Claire Langhammer, um, who uh, supervised all three of my dissertations, that I, I decided this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So again, you know, there, there are so many people at, at Sussex that I was inspired by. But again, they're, they're my top two, I think. Um, they They carried me through and inspired me in ways that I, I didn't think were possible. So um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to them. I mean, that's that's amazing. Like, obviously, everyone knows who you are whenever your name is mentioned now when it comes to Heaver Castle and Anne Boleyn. You know, you are known. <laughs> before, we, before we move on to Anne, I thought we could talk about your books because you've got four. Sure. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, they think when they go to Heaver, they love to buy the book. And I thought you could talk a little bit about the research involved in Becoming Anne. Sure, yeah. So Becoming Anne started between Kate McCaffrey and, and myself, uh, and we authored that book together. It was the second book that I wrote. I had previously written The Berlins of Hever Castle with uh, the wonderful historian Claire Ridgway, uh, which was an absolute treat to, to co-author. But we very much wanted to mark the fact that 2022 is going to be the, the 500th anniversary of Anne Boleyn's first recorded presence at the English court. And we thought, what better way of doing that than really studying the ingredients that went in to make her this Renaissance woman that, that took England by storm? and certainly took Henry VIII by storm later on. So that's where it began, actually. And it was it was in a part to try and tell Anne's story in more depth at Hever. I mean, Anne, having studied Hever for a long time, Anne has always been sort of synonymous with Hever Castle, but her, her story there has changed. And it was a really an effort to inject some primary source research back in to to the visitor experience i guess to embrace the legends that heaver has always had but also to introduce our visitors to the Anne that we find in the the archival records so it was a, an absolute treat uh, to do we looked at Anne's background her early education her family her time at the european court and then of course her her debut at the english court so it was an absolute joy to put on with Kate and a, a real treat to write as well. I, I have to say, I, I adore writing with both Kate and, and Claire. It's heavenly. Amazing. I, I've got three of your books. I admit I don't have Thomas Cromwell yet. Bless you. <laughs> but if any listeners do want the book, I will leave it in the description below so they can go purchase it right away. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Well, as you have mentioned, Heva, you have launched yeah. this week a week-long course online that I think many people yes. signed up to. Absolutely, yeah. I'm I'm really, really excited about it, actually. It's going to be taking place in January, between the 22nd and the 28th of January. And, yeah, it's seven lectures that explore all of Heva's history. So my first book was very much looking at the Berlins at Hever, as the title would suggest. But this is from its building date right to the present day. Uh, seven 40-minute lectures uh, and then a live Q&A with me afterwards. So, yeah, I'm I'm really excited about it. And I've been overwhelmed by the response to it as well. So, um, yeah, uh, very much looking forward to the new year now. So am I. I showed my partner the video today and obviously you say um, it's a perfect Christmas gift. And I just went, you see, you said it's a perfect Christmas gift. Nudge, nudge. I'm, if I'm good, apparently I'm allowed. Amazing. <laughs> I'll go on it anyway. <laughs> so I think we've discussed a lot about your books and a bit about you. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you later. You, you, you tie into Anne Boleyn quite well now. <laughs> we need to talk about the leading lady herself. We do. <laughs> because there's just, there's so much to get through when it comes to Anne. 
isn't there jazz <laughs> there really <laughs> is that's why there are so many books Indeed. in the world and on my bookshelf <laughs> <laughs> so do we know a lot about Anne's early life would you say or do you think it's quite limited do you know that's a really really good question to start with because a lot has been written about Anne's early years and we know very, very little indeed, actually. It, it's, um, there's a lot of, I, I think it's legitimate to be able to do a bit of comparative work. So for example, we know that Anne speaks French and we know that she is very interested in religious books. And we know that she's a consummate um, musician. She can dance well. And we know that um, she has other skills like sewing. So it's it's not out of the realm of speculation to realise that she would have learnt those skills in her youth. Um, and we can compare other people's educations to get an idea of what that would have looked like. But we have no records of it, sadly. And really doesn't appear uh, until 1513, in the in the historical record so yes a, a lot of comparative work can be done but um there's also a huge amount of speculation and myth out there so i think another good point about anne's early years is you see that she gets called a commoner a lot yeah <laughs> and i think it's a real misconception and i thought you'd like to de you know demyth that it us. is and and i think it actually has its roots in in the victorian myth of Anne Boleyn and you can see why it's such an appealing one and actually I think Hever Castle was used to illustrate this um, because it's not the biggest castle in the world in fact it's quite dinky that's why everyone loves it but the idea was that that Thomas Boleyn was this lowly knight with this little modest castle in Kent and Anne was raised incredibly high to, to the throne of England Whereas Hever was one of nearly 40 properties that the Berlins owned. Uh, they occupied some incredibly lavish places like Rochford Hall, uh, Penshurst Place from 1521, places like Bewley, which um, uh, would become the Palace of Bewley, which was New Hall when Thomas Berlin owned it. Then there's Hoo and Blickling Hall. I mean, this is a family with a huge number of properties. And the reason for that is because Thomas Boleyn is the heir apparent to the earldom of Ormond. And her mother is Lady Elizabeth Howard. She comes from one of the premier families in England, albeit they are rather down on their luck because they supported the wrong side at the Battle of Bosworth. So Anne is absolutely at the top of society. She's part of, as Gareth Russell rightly says, the 1%. That This notion that she was a nobody is a complete myth. And yes, it was very unlikely that she would become Queen of England, but we don't need to sort of make that point by uh, ignoring her heritage, which was very impressive indeed. Yeah, absolutely. So we know she was not a commoner, you know, she would have lived very comfortably growing up compared yeah. to a lot of other people at the time. And we know her parents were very, well, especially her mother was like a, a very good lineage compared to Thomas Boleyn. So he was very lucky to get into that hierarchy at court. Yeah. But for Elizabeth and Thomas, do we know, were they happy? How many children they had? You know, how was so, it? We know very sadly next to nothing about Elizabeth Howard. It's one of the things that I would love to discover more of are, are sources relating to Elizabeth. The Boleyns, as you say, had risen really over three generations from being minor landowners in Norfolk to being part of the 1%. And they had done that because of the incredible skill of Geoffrey Boleyn, who really had risen from the, the lower rungs of society uh, to becoming Lord Mayor of London. He made an advantageous marriage into the Who family. His son William married into the Butler family. 
The Butlers are the premier family in Ireland. And then, of course, Thomas marries into the premier family in England. So, yes, they they had risen very quickly and very far. Their marriage was likely an arranged one. Uh, a lot of marriages at the top of society were arranged, uh, as were local marriages to ordinary people. But I think we can see some kind of uh, harmony, shall we say. Uh, Thomas does refer back in his later correspondence to his marriage, and that there isn't any indication of any unhappiness or anything like that. But of course, I'm, I'm I'm always loath to talk about the the happiness of, mar- of a marriage when you only have one side of the the story. I'm sure we'll cover this with Anne Boleyn, but of course we only have one side of the the love letters, which gives us the same issue. But they have a successful marriage, if you'd like to call it that. We know that they have at least five children. That that's the number that we're aware of, and Thomas states in 1538 that Elizabeth had given him a child every summer. So in my opinion, they most likely were all born in Norfolk and probably all before 1505. Though, of course, this is uh, very much up for debate, as I'm sure you are aware. Yes, it's a big debate, isn't it, about when is Anne Boleyn born? Um, I don't, personally, I don't think it was 1507, purely because if she did go to the Low Countries, she was really young. Yes, yeah. And it just doesn't it's... seem conceivable. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think you're completely right. I, I I, don't think we can certainly say it was 1501. It will probably be more accurate to say circa 1500 to 1505. That will probably be a more honest answer. I do think it was towards the earlier uh, end of that spectrum, purely, as you say, because, I mean, there are there are instances where, for example, the uh, one of Brandon's daughters does go to Margaret of Austria's court. I think she's about eight when she goes, but she goes into essentially a nursery. Whereas I think it's quite clear from Margaret of Austria's correspondence to Thomas Boleyn that Anne is part of her household. What what really is the clincher for me is the fact that she not only goes then to France, but she stays in France for seven years as a as a lady in waiting. I cannot en- envisage why uh, a, a child would be in, in that kind of position. I think she has to have at least been born around 1501, 1502, something like that. No, yeah, uh, I completely agree. You know. But yes, like with most things to do with Anne Boleyn, there is dispute and uh, this is not a settled matter. <laughs> now, I don't think it will ever truly be settled. No matter how much we find, it will be a debate always. <laughs> Indeed. And that's why we love it, I guess. Which is fine for me because I get to talk about it more. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally. sure you feel the same. Like, oh. Absolutely. <laughs> so you've ta- you've mentioned then that she went to the Low Countries at the court of Margaret of Austria. Do we know how she got that position? Because obviously that's quite a prestige position. Yeah, massively so. It was essentially the finest finishing school in in Europe. And this is where the Habsburg children are educated. So this is a real coup for for Anne Boleyn. And it it comes about because Thomas Boleyn is a diplomat. He's at Margaret of Austria's court. And he is negotiating with Margaret uh, on behalf of Maximilian uh, for, for a treaty. And Margaret very much takes to Thomas Boleyn. I think he was a very charismatic, charming individual he obviously was ambitious. Every single courtier was. Uh, they, you know, I, I often say that, that the heartbeat of the, the Henrician court was uh, betterment, you know, this uh, drive to do better for oneself. And Thomas is no exception. But he he does form this relationship with Margaret of Austria. They have a wager as to when this treaty will be completed or when they hear back from Maximilian, Thomas wins it. He he bet his horse. And I think the, the outcome essentially was that uh, Margaret gave his, his daughter something more prestigious, I would say, than, than one's horse. And that's a, a jolly good education at her court. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was 1513, we said, isn't it, that she first went? Yes. And- if I'm right from the top of my head, she wasn't there for long. It was not long at all. 
no and and that is again uh, because of the the shifting political winds uh this is often the case between um the habsburg and the valois court and henry shifting um sort of uh, allegiances and therefore it was far more opportune for and transfer into the uh, court of france because henry's sister mary was promised and indeed married the king of france uh, that of course was a very short marriage and we're not actually sure whether anne got there in time for the wedding again the the, the sources just aren't there to verify it in fact she doesn't appear as part of mary's attendance at the wedding but Louis the Twelfth dies very prematurely in the marriage. It's a fruitless one. Mary returns back to England, but Anne Boleyn stays at court and she stays in the train of Queen Claude, uh, who is married to Francis the First, the new French king, and she stays there for the next six or seven years, which is quite remarkable. And I, I would have to say that those were probably the most formative uh, years of her life in that, as we well know from that wonderful quote, she returns to England more French than English, essentially. So, yes, uh, it, it was a pivotal sort of period for her, I think. Oh, yeah, she was obviously trusted as well by her father. Like she must have shown qualities from quite a young age that she was able to be on her own in this court and be fine. Very much so. And, and you know, Thomas Boleyn as a diplomat would have been in France a, a good deal of the time. Very handy, however, both at the Habsburg and the Valois court for Thomas when he's back at England to have an ear to the ground. That ear, of course, was Anne. So you can see that essentially she's building almost, you know, not really a diplomatic position, but she's certainly engaging in politics. It was beneficial both for her education, but also for Thomas, for his job. And Thomas does incredibly well. And I do like to think that Anne played a, a not insignificant part in that success, um, because we know that she, uh, when she contends with the likes of Cardinal Wolsey, is an astute politician. She had to learn that uh, somewhere. And I, I like to think that her father was involved but also that some key players at the French court were just as influential. No, yeah, absolutely. I think her early years are so overlooked. You know, it's just from yeah. 1522, she's, yeah, she's at court. But she learns so much, like, yeah, it's, it really is like, when you go into it, she had so many figures around her that will have influenced her life. Definitely so. And I have to say here, it's chiefly the women who have studied Anne's life, who have really analysed this period of her life. Actually, if you go back to those earlier histories of Anne, France and her time with Margaret of Austria are really ignored. They're certainly not covered in depth. And it's almost like the, it's, a, it's an interesting prelude to when the man comes on the scene and Anne is of importance. Uh, that, of course, is baloney. And we, we do have to recognise it is those women who have, have studied Anne's life, Dr Tracy Borman, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, who really are shining uh, ever more fascinating light into these uh, this woman and other women in their own right. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to have worked alongside uh, someone like Kate McCaffrey, who's done just that as well. So, yes. Again, I completely agree. You know, it's it's always from his point of view, and it's kind of why I've started this podcast. It's like she, we know her because of her. It's not because of him. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. It's her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what, she's in France for like seven years, as we say, and yeah. that's a that's a long time to be away from home. It is. It but, is. But. She was a lady-in-waiting to Queen Claude, but was she close to Marguerite of Navarre? I think yes, and that really comes not from correspondence that we have at the time, but from correspondence later, when Anne is rising and is queen. 
uh, and makes a fair few comments about um, wanting to be reacquainted with her and so forth. Friendship aside, I think there was something more important going on. And it was that Anne was able to observe women exercising power in a very particular kind of way. Um, Queen Claude was almost perpetually pregnant during Anne's time in France, which must have given her uh, an idea of sort of what was expected of a queen. But there was also a difference with Claude. She was very enlightened religiously. She was very pious. She had beautiful manuscript and printed books, something that she shared in common with Margaret of Austria, who had a very enlightened library as well, with works such as Christine de Pizan uh, on her shelves. So I think Claude and Margaret of Austria's love of books definitely rubs off on Anne Boleyn. She also witnesses people like Marguerite de Angoulême, who is uh, giving refuge to radical reformists and very particular reformists in two. They are evangelical. They are non-schismatic reformists, i.e. they believe in reforming the church from within, going back to scripture and fundamentally allowing people to access the word of God in their own language. This is something that Anne becomes passionate about. But also, we can't overlook Francis's mother, Louise of Savoy, who acts as regent for uh, Francis on at least two occasions. She's witnessing these highly cultured, very well educated women. They are influencing her during her own education. And most importantly, I think, Anne is exposed to the notion that women do not have to be necessarily subservient and that they can be important political actors in their own right. They can exercise agency. And if there's one thing that I love trying to locate is Anne's agency, because I think she exercises it in some really interesting ways. They aren't always safe ways, and I'm sure we will get to her downfall, but I, I do think some of her downfall is rooted in the power she exercised. So, yeah, I, I, I think these women are fundamental to understanding Anne Boleyn. No, yeah, absolutely. I think Anne Boleyn learned a lot from the women she was surrounded with. Yeah. I, I like to think her mother was a massive influence as well. Like, I'd love to think that they were really close. Definitely so. I mean, when, when Henry does turn his attentions to Anne, uh, Elizabeth Boleyn is off, often the chaperone. Now, this wasn't uncommon for mothers and daughters, but Elizabeth Boleyn is close at court with Anne. She obviously is uh, most likely a heaver also when Anne is present there. But also there's sort of an un unspoken often presence at Hever, um, and that is, of course, her, her grandmother, Lady Margaret Butler. Now, we do know that Margaret Butler, unfortunately has to relinquish her legal duty, shall we say, uh, her power of attorney to her son from around 1519. It's possible that she was suffering from some kind of dementia. But I, I do think she was probably an early influence on, on Anne Boleyn. We know that she lives out her days at Hever. In fact, she's the last Boleyn to live at Hever. So she's this sort of presence that isn't spoken about uh, a huge amount. But thanks to people like Gareth Russell, who very much champions Mar Margaret Butler. She is obviously a very proud Irish woman born at Kilkenny Castle. And key to Thomas Boleyn's success, she fights for that earldom of Ormond. So, yes, very, very strong women who are influencing the very, very strong Anne Boleyn. Absolutely. Before Anne returns to England, the field of the cloth of gold in 1520 basically like a festival falls now but one of the yeah. biggest things in 1520 <laughs> and no one really knows if Anne attended but I assume Indeed. she did. I think it's a safe assumption to state that it's very likely that she did. There are a number of reasons for this. Thomas Boleyn um, is essentially 
setting up this summit on Wolsey's behalf. Of course, it's all a big facade because behind the scenes, Henry is doing the dirty on France and petitioning for a treaty with the emperor. But of course, this is all about a show. And we know that George Boleyn is present. We're almost certain that Mary Boleyn is present. Elizabeth Boleyn is definitely present in the retinue of Queen Catherine of Aragon, Henry's wife. And what are you going to need a lot of at a summit between an English court and a French court? You're going to need people who can speak both the languages. So Anne would have come very much in handy in Queen Claude's train, where we know she was employed. So I, I think we can surmise that it's very likely that she was in attendance. And um, this was very much a meeting between the two courts. Uh, it was a rather extravagant one. And um, I should think the people paying the taxes uh, that funded it were rather stumped, uh, shall we say, by, by the expenditure. But yes, I, I, I think it's very likely she was there. And it's not inconceivable that that was the first time that she glimpsed Henry VIII. Yes, I... I can't remember what TV show it is now. I think it is the Netflix Blood, Sex and Royalty. Indeed. Where it's where she meets him, where you're also in the documentary. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I promise I don't stalk you. <laughs> I just watch a lot of Tudor things. Absolutely. It's it's just, you know, what comes with being a, being an Anne fan. Yeah, I'm just, honestly, I, I am bankrupt because of Anne. <laughs> <laughs> but Blood, Sex and Royalty, you know, it, it shows them possibly meeting for the first time obviously it serves them on, on the tv show like to show as a romantic point of view indeed but she probably did you know see him and go yeah. yes yeah <laughs> and you know um we have no idea if that um sighting took place it probably did and we you know if it did we can probably surmise that henry wasn't particularly interested in Anne at that time because although she returns back to England as the political tide is shifting. In fact, her return to England almost causes a diplomatic incident uh, because King Francis wants to know why Anne Boleyn is leaving court. Is there a, 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 a shifting wind here politically? Is he going to be betrayed by England? And Wolsey comes back with a response that, no, no, she's going to be married into Ireland which of course was partly true with regard to who was going to inherit the earldom of Ormond. Actually, if you look at the precedents, Thomas was the rightful heir through his mother, Lady Margaret Butler. However, Piers Butler, who was a, a cousin, had very astutely made it very politically difficult to give it to Thomas because he had essentially, and I'm referring again here to Gareth Russell's research, married all of his children to the surrounding families to that earldom. So politically, it was difficult. So Wolsey was uneasy about choosing either side. He was obfuscating for quite some time. And his solution, which he sort of chalked up with the Duke of Norfolk, one of the most loathsome uh, people at the Tudor court, uh, and who was, of course, Anne's uncle. They came up with this plan that Anne was going to marry Piers's son, and he would then eventually inherit the title, and both sides would be happy because Anne's heirs would uh, then inherit the earldom. Thomas was not at all happy about this. Anne was not at all happy about this, and the the marriage never happens. But that was sort of the political, both familial and international reason for Anne coming back to England when she did. Amazingly put, I need to learn more skills from you when talking about Anne Boleyn or anyone else. I'm afraid I, I'm afraid I just waffle. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of go... <laughs> so we, we know she was meant to marry his butler's son, James. Indeed. Was she a lady in waiting for Catherine of Aragon at this point? So that was, I mean, her, her first recorded. So we know that it's in March 1522 that Anne first appears at court. And I think we can safely say that she is in Catherine of Aragon's employ at that point. They are performing at a court mask, the Chateau Vert, 
And they are, of course, performing for the imperial ambassadors because Henry has indeed decided to uh, ditch Francis and move back to the emperor. So, yes, she is going to be in Catherine of Aragon's employ by this stage and has sort of rejected this um, compromise marriage and very much appears to want to be able to carve out her own destiny. And she very much appears to have taken a shine to someone in Wolsey's household, who is, of course, Henry Percy and is the heir to Northumberland. So I think we can see in this manoeuvre that this probably was about love, I think. As we said earlier, marriages were political. Uh, Chiefly, they were ways for families to prosper, but more importantly, for the state to ensure loyalty. So marrying into certain families was very much a, a, a political concern. And there was no way that Cardinal Wolsey was going to sanction this love match. And I think it's very likely that Henry VIII was involved here as well. Uh, The marriage is broken up, the promised marriage, shall we say. They, of course, weren't married. If you've watched The Other Berlingo, you probably have been told that they they were married, but they they weren't. They were promised to each other. And Anne is sent back to Hever. And according to um, Cavendish, Wolsey's gentleman usher, Anne starts a lifelong hatred of the cardinal in fact he says at heaver she smoked or she fumed in fury at uh, what had happened to her but she is nonetheless back at court before long and it's probably i would say around late 1525 early 1526 at the earliest that henry does turn his attention towards anne no, yeah, absolutely. I think Henry Percy, I think he came up again a few times, didn't he, throughout the courtship and the marriage? Indeed, yes. It was a, a complication, shall we say. It it becomes an issue because of what had been arranged before Anne is married and, of course, after Anne is married. And on a number of occasions, Percy has to deny kind of pre-contract or anything like that. Absolutely. I think there must have been something serious if it kept coming up so much. You know, it wasn't just some yes. dalliance. It was they were intending to get married. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that's that's definitely worth considering. And I, th- I, I do think we can say quite comfortably that Anne never really forgave Wolsey. Um, and I don't think it was just because it was a, a good uh, prospect marriage. I think it must have been underpinned by feelings too. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Do we, was Anne sent home after you know it got broken up? You know, was she sent her back home to Hever? Yeah, yeah. It's it's to Hever that she returns, and it's it's really nice. It's one of the earliest periods that we can say definitively that Anne is in residence at the castle. So yes, uh, I suppose you could say that she's in disgrace. I like to think of it more as uh, being out of sight and mind. It's uh, often a good tactic, I would say, that families employ to separate people and uh, hope they get over it. But as I say, the the animosity that Anne holds towards Wolsey, I think, would suggest otherwise. Uh, She is never really a fan of the Cardinal, even though Thomas Boleyn is in his employ and retains a very good relationship with the Cardinal. So... It made things tricky, shall we say. Yeah, it did. After Anne is sent home, do we know when she returns to court? We don't have an exact date, but it has to have been before the love letters start, which we can roughly start to date around 1526, as I say. And I I think there there was a very good um, argument made by Starkey that it's at Christmas 1526 that Anne finally agrees to marry the king but it's not an instant uh, acceptance and actually we know that Anne returns again to Hever before then 
when Henry first makes his intentions clear, Anne doesn't acquiesce at all. In fact, she leaves court. And I think a closer analysis of those letters show a very one-sided romance. And I even hesitate to call it that because I think it becomes more of an obsession, actually, on Henry's part. The king wants for nothing and yet is being denied that which he is normally able to get very freely and just doesn't say yes. She won't acquiesce. She won't become an official mistress. She won't reply to his letters. This drives Henry wild. And, you know, you can see him making these grandiose sort of signs of affection towards her um, by killing a deer and asking her to eat it, thinking about him, down to the very, very personal and slightly schoolboyish uh, trait of putting her initials in a heart at the end of the letter. I think Anne was consuming every waking minute of Henry's mind. And I don't know if the same could be said for Anne Boleyn. And I think it would be difficult for anyone to say if she really had any affection for him at this stage, because we just don't have those letters. And although Henry refers to her responses in his own letters, of course, he's referring to what he understands from them, his interpretation of them. And it, it always fascinates me. There's a very interesting, of course, Heaver has two beautiful books of hours, but there is a third in the British Library, King's MS9, where Henry and Anne talk to each other. Uh, Henry writes a message to Anne, very much talking about the pains of love that he has. But Anne doesn't talk of love. She talks about being loving and kind. That doesn't tell me that this is a woman burning with desire for a king. I think there was a tipping point, and that's when Henry obviously wasn't going to stop pursuing her and promised to make any union that they had legitimate. I think Anne said yes to the proper offer, not the the offer of uh, of being a mistress. But yes, it's a it's a fascinating question. Did she love him? I'm not so sure. No, I, it's again, it's another debate when it comes to Anne. You know, did she, did she not love him? I think she respected him for yes. most of it. I think it was a mutual respect, but I don't think she loved him as much. As... No, I, I, I think she, I think she knew that she could influence him in very interesting ways. I don't mean in manipulative ways. Mm. I, I mean that he was so fascinated by her that he did things that were uncharacteristic. So, for example, the Berlins were great innovators with buildings. Um, Jeffrey Berlin incorporated the old Blickling into the, the new House of Fair Brick that he built. And Thomas Berlin was a great innovator at New Hall and at Hever too. Anne had a love for building too. And it's it's really during Anne's reign that Henry really starts to build properly palaces for the first time. So she was able to influence him, I think, in very interesting ways. And I think she had a love for politics and power. And I think she was good at it and enjoyed it. So I think there was something more important at play for Anne, and that was influence. And she was able to exercise that influence in really interesting ways and not as this sort of Machiavellian scheming harlot that she has been characterised as being. She's far more interesting than that. She she really is. And we still talk about her 500 years later. Well, Indeed. 400 and whatever, but... We'll say yeah. 500. We'll <laughs> say 500 to be easier. But obviously once she, you know, she refuses to be his mistress and he's like, okay, I, I really want Anne, but she's not going to be my mistress. So what do I do? And, you know, he proposes marriage. And that's when it starts to get really serious. Like this will change England if it goes through. Yeah. Well, it, it's a really interesting one because if the Pope had given Henry an annulment, it wouldn't have been the first time. This this actually wasn't an unusual thing to ask of a pope. 
Uh, this was a legitimate process. And I think in the early years, there was, in Henry's mind at least, the, the possibility that that would happen. But of course, everything changed when Charles sacks Rome and takes <laughs> uh, the nephew of um, the, the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, holds the Pope hostage, essentially. That, that changes everything. And that other wonderful woman in question here, Catherine of Aragon, is able to exercise enormous power. You know, when the compromise is made and Cardinal Campeggio is sent over to hear the, the, the case on behalf of the Pope, she plays an absolute blinder. You know, her, her Blackfriars speech is just phenomenal. And she essentially will not bow down to any authority other than Clement. So, you know, I don't think Anne and Henry necessarily could have known what how difficult it was going to be, that it was going to take seven years uh, to get to that point. But seven years it did, did take. And actually, I think this whole process pushed Anne spiritually into a direction that I don't think she necessarily would have gone into had it not been for those political circumstances. I talked earlier about her being evangelical and her her idea of reform was most likely non-schismatic, not breaking with Rome, but reforming, trying to influence for reform reform with, from within. But of course that all changes when she, I, I, I suppose, realises that it's never going to happen unless there is a break um, with Rome. And Anne does directly influence that. Um, we have very good evidence that it's it's Anne that introduces William Tyndale's The Obedience of the Christian Man to Henry, which I think sows the seed in his mind that there isn't any mention of the Pope in the Bible. And he's very much influenced by the power that could be gleaned as an emperor being next to God himself. So Anne is, Anne is key here, and she actually exercises a huge amount of that power from Hever Castle. It's why I think it's one of the most fascinating places uh, in England, because she makes that decision to marry Henry at Hever. And for much of 1528 and 1529, um, when things are really hotting up at court, Anne is at Hiva, not only you know surviving the sweating sickness, but d directly influencing the direction of the the, the annulment and and the eventual break with Rome. It's a pivotal place, and it should be recognised as such, definitely. No, yeah, absolutely. And I think obviously seven years is such a long time to even if she didn't want to get married to him, you know, seven years of waiting to get married to him. <laughs> Do you think it was quite an emotional strain on her? Because I feel like once it gets past fifteen twenty eight, she's not as jo not jolly, but you know, she's more paranoid from fifteen twenty eight. Yeah, I mean there there were huge pressures on her, and unfortunately, she unfortunately Catherine is the the victim of the same circumstance. Um, that is the position that Henry has placed them both in in that Catherine automatically becomes this martyr figure, genuinely beloved of the English people, and is legitimately Henry's wife. Uh, everyone knows this, you know, the, the sort of weaseling out of the, the marriage that Henry is attempting is a huge insult to Catherine. And the consequence of it is that she was never queen, that her daughter's illegitimate, and that her, her life has been rubbished. But of course, it's very difficult to complain about the king and it's very easy to blame the other woman. And Anne becomes the, you know, the, the pendulum swings from Catherine the martyr to, to Anne, the, the homewrecker, the, the, the person that is ruining this glorious and celebrated marriage. And it, it's not an exaggeration to say that she is loathed. The Boleyns become loathed individuals at court. Catherine calls Anne the scandal of Christendom and it is a scandal in Christendom because Catherine is a devout and devoted queen and wife so yes a lot of pressure on Anne Boleyn there are a number of occasions where I think you can see 
the crack beneath the veneer later in her queenship as well, because she is under so much enormous pressure, both from a hostile court and also an increasingly hostile king. So, yes, um, enormous pressure. And I have to admire her for sort of persevering. Yeah, I, th- I think it was an emotional time for a lot of people, not just Anne. I think Catherine of Aragon immensely struggled. And I think so did Mary as well. Yes, you know, yes. It's, it's so un- not talked about when it comes to Catherine and Mary. Yeah. And tying in another one of your books is <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Arthur. and Anne, Queen's Rivals and Mothers. Indeed, you, yeah. You and Kate and Alison try and show that they weren't as opposite as people like to think. No, definitely not. I think they actually shared an enormous amount in common. And the thing that divided them, they had in common. They were very close to the same man. I think in an alter- alternate universe, they would have been uh, enormous friends. I, I don't think they would have gr- agreed on questions of religion but they probably therefore would have debated them quite amicably and of course we always ignore the fact that um Catherine and Anne were together a lot not just in the years before Henry turned his attentions towards Anne but during that terrible period for both Catherine and Anne where they have to live cheek by jowl at court you know and and have this weird pretense that everything's fine when, of course, Catherine knows, Anne knows, everyone knows they're, you know, in a Petri dish together and everyone's looking at them and, and, and wondering what's going to happen. It must have been intolerable. Absolutely. I would have hated to have been there. It must have been so awkward. Yes. Yeah, trying to be normal <laughs> when it's very much <laughs> not. Yeah, no, definitely so. So we know that Rome does not go for the divorce it is very much well they don't even give an answer for i think it's seven years isn't it they wait until they get married to give an answer indeed yeah so by the time they've decided you know what we're breaking with the church we want a divorce things start to shift again don't they it's so Catherine was cast out and we know that anne was made marquess of pembroke as well on the 1st of september 1532 and we also know they are preparing to go to Calais and meet Francis the first so this is when you know Anne is probably knowing she's going to be queen very soon so I was wondering what you thought about how it started to look for a lot of England because obviously Anne is not liked by this point you know she is hated across the country but this must have been amazing for Anne. You know, she's waited such a long time and she's getting very, very close to that crown. Yeah, she's she's worked enormously hard and going to France, she's going to a very familiar territory. They they need a, at least one European power to, to back them um, if they're going to be at all safe. And France, of course, is the only option, really. Um, because of Catherine's links to the emperor. And they do get that support from Francis. And I actually am in the camp where I think that they marry uh, on St. Erkenwald's Day in November, just as they return from France. I think they have an early, very secret marriage. And I think there is a period where they're unaccounted for in the records, actually, from when they land at Dover to when they're back at court. I have a feeling that was their honeymoon and that's most likely where they first decided to consummate their marriage and Elizabeth was likely conceived after that period and before the second marriage. So, yes, this is a very difficult um, time for the country. It's enormously difficult for Catherine and Mary, but Anne is finally going to get that crown and she's worked jolly hard for it I think she has you know almost stepped into a a position of power in the in the way that she has influenced and directed the the direction of the the break with Rome and of course uh, her her men are put in positions of power the Archbishop of Canterbury is her former chaplain so she is exerting enormous influence but at the same time she's under enormous pressure now 
because Henry has done the unthinkable. He has broken with Rome. He has organised an even more lavish coronation than his own, and that afforded um, to Queen Catherine of Aragon. So Anne is outwardly very much his queen consort. Of course, a lot of people don't agree, and that kind of pressure must have been intolerable, particularly when you're pregnant. And even more so when you are very much hoping that this is going to be the much longed for male heir that, of course, is at the centre of all of this. And of course, it, it isn't a boy. It is a daughter. Now, contrary to popular belief, there isn't this turning point at that point. I don't think Henry consoles Anne and says that the boys will follow. The jousts are cancelled just as they were when Mary had been born um, to Catherine of Aragon. But there isn't this immediate turning point where Henry all of a sudden loathes Anne Boleyn, as you all too often see in, in film. They still have a very cordial relationship. He's still very much devoted to her. And Anne is also very much devoted to her daughter. So whilst externally things are very troubling indeed and of course even more troubling are those who will not support the marriage Thomas More, Bishop Fisher and of course the eventual death of those individuals sends shockwaves not just through the country but through Europe so this is a very difficult time for Anne Boleyn and it's much easier to blame her than it is Henry. Yeah I I think she gets the scapegoat doesn't she she she's the well you know he married her so whatever but i don't think he was forced to marry her if he didn't want to no you couldn't force him <laughs> too much <laughs> no he wasn't a man to be forced into anything no 15 30 year i think everyone can agree was a m- pivotal year a lot of things changed and it should have been a happy time i think for henry and Anne. They're finally together and, you know, they're going to have a baby. It's It should have been good. But I also think Henry expects Anne to be a wife now. She's not the mistress. She's not in charge anymore. She is a wife. Yeah, I think you're completely right there. Anne, was, uh, Anne didn't take very easily, I don't think, to being a submissive queen consort. Uh, and actually, she hadn't been exposed to particularly submissive Queen's consort, or those around who were exercise, exercising power as, as women. We talked earlier about the powerful women at the Valois court. And also Catherine of Aragon was a very influential queen consort. I think Henry had had enough and, and just expected things to go much more smoothly than they did. And of course, all of that turmoil, those seven years of course, we're going to get exponentially worse when uh, he had to break with Rome and uh, marry a woman that was widely despised in the country and abroad. So there are enormous pressures on both Henry and Anne. It doesn't help that there is famine and plague in certain years during Anne's queenship. And then, of course, the question of um, the supremacy really takes purchase. Henry wants people to swear allegiance to him. And this really is a a tipping point for a lot of people and and people die, as we spoke of about Warren Fisher. So, yeah, a lot of this is laying on our shoulders and it's a a heavy load to carry. I think, you know, she was queen for such a short time, as we all know, and I don't think any of it was happy for the most part. I think, I mean, it was immense stress, wasn't it? You know, she now had to give a son and she might be tolerated. If she gave a son, that's fine, or whatever. But she obviously didn't, and she was still feisty. She was not giving up without a fight. No, definitely not. And I think it's best described as, as Ives did. Henry and Anne always had a tempestuous relationship. Um, you can see that right from the beginning, that Anne is not acquiescing to Henry. So there, there is always a p- power dynamic at play. And he, he describes their relationship as sunshine and storms. And that carries on from the, the courtship into the relationship. So there are periods where Anne and Henry are merry together. You know, it, it isn't a disastrous marriage. It isn't the disastrous marriage you might think it was because of 
the ending that we all know comes. There are periods of joy and happiness. And Anne does exert power at court. She changes things at court. Catherine of Aragon very much adhered to the old way of running a, a queen's apartments, whereas Anne very much went for the continental fashion where there were far more men in her chambers. There was far much more male presence in Anne's privy apartments. And this, of course in retrospect, would lead to a lot of gossip and suspicion. But actually what Anne was doing was building on that Renaissance influence that she'd had. And I think she genuinely enjoyed the company of men. I think she enjoyed debate. I think she enjoyed debating with Henry. I think she liked the arts and literature and theology. And of course, she influences her women too. We, we know that she very boldly uh, displays William Tyndale's translation of the New Testament in her apartments and encourages her women to read the Bible in their own language. This is radical stuff. She is exerting enormous power as queen here. So although I think that the reign is marked by this undercurrent of disappointment, suspicion and anger, it doesn't mean that those thousand days were necessarily all unhappy. Anne was exerting power as queen. Um, she was making a change. She was making a difference. And she was thriving as well as fighting for her life at times. Yeah, absolutely. I think her reign is very important. I think a lot of things happen in them three years. But she had a stepdaughter that is... We know is Mary the first. Indeed. Do we know what their relationship was like at all? Their relationship was bad. And can you blame Mary? This is the woman that has, in her eyes, is responsible for taking away her legitimacy, taking away her mother. Catherine is forbidden to see her daughter until they acknowledge their illegitimacy, the illegitimacy of the marriage and of uh, Mary. Um, the way Catherine and Mary are treated is utterly abhorrent. And Anne does make attempts to reconcile with Mary and to act as a go-between between Mary and her father. But of course, that's never going to happen from Mary's perspective. And who can blame her? From Mary's perspective, this is the other woman. And I, I genuinely think from Mary's perspective that she thought that Anne was the issue. Mary would be so, you know, sorely mistaken in that actually when Anne was removed so cruelly Mary's plight actually became worse it hardened Henry's attitude towards Mary and it is after Anne is executed that she is forced to submit to Henry's will in the most humiliating way that the common issue that they have is Henry but again it's much easier to blame Anne um, than one's own father. Mary was devoted to her father beforehand and Henry had called her his pearl. You know, he was very uh, a very strong influence on Mary's early life. And it's one thing to cast aside your loyal wife, but to put aside your daughter is a rather wicked thing, I would argue. I have a lot of time for Mary and... Again, I, I think this was a pivotal moment in her life. I think it shaped what came after. Absolutely. I think, again, Mary is another one of those Tudor ladies that had so much happen and she's nicknamed very cruelly, I think, Bloody Mary. Yeah, it's one of my pet peeves, actually. I, I think it's intolerably unfair that uh, she is landed with that rather nasty misogynistic little moniker i think it's about time we put that to bed yeah absolutely i think so i've been i've been reading a lot more about mary and i realized you know she she wasn't as bad as the books and the tv shows would tell you no i i think she was an absolutely fascinating woman and i would highly commend the work of dr linda porter one of the most brilliant books that I've ever read, um, actually. And also the work that's being done at the moment 
there are a number of brilliant Marian scholars um, who are very much challenging Mary's reputation. So yes, I would I would strongly urge anyone listening to think again about Mary and to look at her life, perhaps in the same way that we have afforded Elizabeth, who is equally religiously intolerant, as was their father. So yes, it, it's time to reappraise Mary more popularly, I think. That work has certainly been done like with you know by scholars like Dr. Linda Porter who who've done a, a sterling job. Absolutely agree. I love the biography by Dr. Linda Porter. It is fabulous. I and mean, you do see Mary so differently. Yeah, yeah. But as we know, Mary did oh, quite right, you know, being upset with Anne. You know, she was her father's daughter, so it was understandable. But we also know Thomas Cromwell, by this point, was a major player in the Tudor court. But we also know Anne and Thomas were close at the beginning. But by the time she becomes queen, it's much more fragile. Yeah, I I think there was a relationship. I think it was purely professional. I actually very much agree with Dermot McCulloch here. Uh, Sorry, Professor Dermot McCulloch. When we look at their relationship I I think it's very functional Um, I don't think there's much evidence that they were allies and perhaps they naturally should have been because they are both reformists though slightly different um, kind of influence of reform but Henry is not Anne's servant he is Henry's servant and their relationship being functionary does break down no yeah absolutely my I think Thomas Cromwell might crop up a little bit when it comes to the downfall of Anne Boleyn, just a teeny little weeny bit. Yeah. (laughs) We know Anne has not given a son by 1536. When when do you think Henry started to not be obsessed with Anne anymore? Is there a pivotal moment? I actually... mm, changed my mind on this when I read the brilliant study of Anne's really sort of final 15 months. It's called The Final Year of Anne Boleyn by the phenomenal Natalie Gruniger, an extraordinary historian. And she analysed those 15 months and saw a much more gradual decline in the relationship. And actually, I think the pivotal year was 1535, when there was enormous pressure, socio-political pressure, there's famine, there are the civil unrest. Of course, this is the year that Moore and Fisher are executed. There are building pressures. And the thing that would alleviate that pressure, perhaps for Henry, that would make him think that it was all worth it, would have been the delivery of a secure success- succession. He he wants to maintain the Tudor dynasty. And Anne, tragically, has a number of miscarriages, the last one being a son. That comes hot on the heels of a rather unfortunate and humiliating jousting accident. Now, there is a school of thought that Henry sustained a, a head injury and that he was unconscious for two hours and that his personality changed. I don't actually necessarily agree with that. I do think he was a changed man after that accident, but not because of a brain injury. I think he was humiliated. I think he was emasculated. I think he had a number of men witness this humiliation who would fall with Anne Boleyn. I don't think there's a coincidence there. And also he is unable to joust and perform this art, this performance of chivalry in any meaningful way ever again. And he's also left with a wound on his leg that will never heal. He essentially becomes disabled at this point, ever increasing so throughout his reign. It completely changes him physically and emotionally. And he, Henry always wanted 
an Agincourt moment. You know, he wanted to wage war with France. He wanted those glories. That never really happened for Henry. He has the Battle of the Spurs, um, but no major successes. And the only way that he could realise this potential, this idea of chivalry, this idea of being a warrior king, was on the tilt yard in jousting. And he is deprived of that identity in this moment in the most humiliating way. I do think it's a, a, a changing point, a turning point. I do think Anne's miscarriage may have been related to, uh, or, or certainly her her emotional state at the time was related to that accident. Actually, I think it's quite difficult and problematic to attribute the miscarriage in that way we we just can't be certain ab about that particularly because she had miscarriages before so there are a number of determining factors i think and not just one i think it's messy i think it's complicated just as anne's and henry's relationship was messy and complicated as had their courtship been but it did turn sour and it wasn't just sour for anne it became deadly and I'm firmly in the camp that the obsession that Henry had for her, which he may well have believed was love, quickly turned to real hatred. And I think he ordered her murder. He did it judicially, so it was judicial murder, but it was murder nonetheless. And it was an act of unspeakable horror. I absolutely agree. Whenever I think of Anne's downfall, I, I do get emotional. You know, it's so cruel and it's so unjust. Yeah. I think Thomas Cromwell, to be fair, I'm not the biggest fan of him, <laughs> but he does get wrongly blamed for a lot of that. And I, I think Henry decided very from January that he was done with Anne. There was no reprieve. And I think her downfall is because of Henry. You know. Yeah, I, I I, always have been of the belief, especially since immersing myself in the primary record, that Cromwell was the architect. Um, he came up with the plan. He says this. He tells Chapuis that he made the whole thing up. He, he concocts this unbelievable litany of charges and horrendous offences that Anne has committed because, of course, People have to be horrified. People have to understand why she needs to be executed. But the person that ordered the architect was Henry. And Cromwell is quite clear about that as well. Henry asked him to do it. And he talks about the, the lengths that he had to go to arrange it. I think he worked hard. But of course, when a king allows a queen, his wife, to stand trial... The jury, who of course are his servants, are under no illusion the verdict that they are to deliver, and that is a guilty one. So yes, a, a very tragic and horrifying end to a rather fascinating life. Mm, no, absolutely. I think it's so quick. You yeah. Know, the court, even the court were shocked. For someone that didn't like her, they were like, whoa what's happened here and i think if you could tell us a little bit more about the final weeks of Anne, i think that would be amazing yeah it's probably it's, it's probably the quickest downfall of henry's reign you know she's dead within a couple of weeks it's extraordinary really and i i think that one of the most illuminating sources comes from lancelot the carl uh, the poem that he wrote of Anne's life in the, the weeks following her downfall, her execution. And he very definitely notes in the French translation, the original, that there is a turning point where the court, of course, believe the charges because Smeaton has confessed. But there is a turning point. Anne, of course, is arrested on the, the 2nd of May. She's taken to the Tower of London and... You know, this is unprecedented. She's held prisoner in the rooms that have been refurbished for her coronation, uh, the Queen's apartments, and she's put on trial. And at that trial, although she has not been informed of what she is charged with, she is able to defend herself so amiably that the court thinks she's going to get off. 
the spectators who witness her performance and especially that of George, her brother, who is accused of adultery with um, his sister, the Queen. They are intelligent, they're quick, they're witty. They believe the innocence of these people. And that sends shockwaves actually through the court. Even Eustache Apui, who is, of course, the imperial ambassador, he is devoted to Catherine of Aragon. He does not believe that Anne is guilty. He is horrified about what is happening to Anne Boleyn because he understands it to be a miscarriage of justice. And you can you can very much see Anne in the dark at the beginning. She isn't aware of, uh, of why she has been arrested. But actually, I think she understood that the, the tide had turned against her. We have this very interesting source where a few days before she is arrested, she entrusts the spiritual welfare of her daughter, Elizabeth, to Matthew Parker, her almoner. Now, that to me is the the move of someone who understands that she's not going to be around. Maybe she didn't understand that she was going to die, but she certainly understood, I think, that she wasn't going to be an influential presence in her daughter's life. Perhaps she thought she'd be sent away like Catherine had been. Um, but of course, that wasn't the end that Henry had in store for Anne Boleyn. He sent for a French executioner before Anne stood trial. He always intended for her to die. In fact, Tracy Borman did some really important work alongside the National Archives where she looked at the King's precedent book. Um, this is, you know, precedence that he is setting down. Henry's DNA is all over Anne's execution. He determines how high the scaffold will be. He determines that it should be draped in black, that it was to be a sword that would behead Anne. And more chillingly than all of that, he determines and proclaims that any future queen is also to be executed in this manner. The horror of that idea in his head that this could happen again. And of course it does. So everything that happens to Anne in the tower, the torment that she goes through is very deliberate. Um, they don't tell her the charges because they want her to talk. She's not allowed to write anything because they want her to talk. And talk she does. She talks through why she thinks. Is it this conversation that she had? Is it this action that she made? And from those threads, these, those kernels of truth, Cromwell was able to spin an elaborate web of lies. And that really sealed Anne's fate. She almost fed it herself, unbeknownst to her. And of course, she is sentenced to death. Actually, she's meant to die on the 18th of May, but it, her execution is delayed. We're not entirely sure why. I think it's far more to do with the annulment of their marriage, which I do think Anne agreed to. I think she was still in hope of life. Uh, but of course, the death of her brother and the other men accused alongside her, I think, was the death knell of that final kernel of hope that Anne had um, that she would be sent away. But her final day on earth began very early. They came for her at 8am. She was led to what was supposed to be a private execution. But unfortunately, a lot of mistakes were made on that day. And I think those mistakes were made because not everyone was as sure that Anne was going to die as Henry had been. Henry had ordered that all the foreigners, the non-English speaking people, were removed from the Tower of London. Um, but unfortunately, the gates were left open. So approximately 1,000 to 2,000 people bore witness to Anne's execution. So it wasn't particularly private, though, perhaps more so than the execution of her brother and the other men accused alongside her on Tower Hill. But Anne was incredibly composed. At the end, one eyewitness noted that she'd never looked so beautiful. Um, she mounted the scaffold and gave what was an archetypal scaffold speech, save for one detail. She did not confess her guilt. Um, she mentioned that she had been found guilty according to the law, but she added that she would not speak anything against it. She did not submit to that guilty verdict. Uh, she did not confess any guilt, which was very Anne Boleyn and would have sent shockwaves through the spectators who were all accustomed to the 
expectation of admitting guilt at the point of execution. Anne had actually asked that William Kingston hear her last confession and she had sworn twice on the host that she was innocent and wanted this to be publicly known. So this was almost putting a seal on that protestation of innocence by publicly not admitting to guilt at the point of death. It certainly didn't save her. She then had her um, in mantle removed by her ladies. She took off the English gable hood that she was wearing herself and she paid the executioner £23, six shillings and eight pence for the duty he was to perform. She then prayed, kneeling into um, the straw and she was blindfolded. Two of the eyewitness accounts state that she had her eyes bandaged and then she died. The executioner cut off her head with a single stroke of the the double-edged sword and she was buried unceremoniously in the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, somewhere in the chapel. There's a whole episode, I'm sure, on whether Anne was actually buried where the Victorians thought she was. I'm not so sure. But yes, we'll we'll save that for another day. So yeah, that that I think is the end of Anne Boleyn. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was, <laughs> it was I mean you put it beautifully, you know, she was brave until the end. And I think it says a lot about her. You know, she was a feisty woman and she could have gone out there and go, I'm not guilty. <laughs> yeah. She knew that Elizabeth needed to be okay. And I think yeah, that she, says a lot. She died with grace and dignity, but she died boldly and um, she died as she had lived. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a horrid thing to imagine and to talk about, really, and certainly to research, but it's one of her finest performances. Oh, yeah. and there were... Absolutely is. So sadly, we know Anne died. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I think she left a bit of a legacy, hasn't she? Obviously. Yeah, very much so. And I, I would say her legacy is probably greater than the spectacle and wonder of Gloriana, her daughter. Yeah, I, I think her legacy is growing, actually. Um, I think more and more people are interested in Anne Boleyn, perhaps than ever have been nowadays. She is still remarkably popular and inspires people in many, many different ways, uh, whether it just be through popular culture or through academia or through popular history books or documentaries. Uh, musicals. I mean, the, there is no end to Anne's popularity at the at present. So, the further we get away from her, I think the the closer we get to her in a perverse kind of way. And um, yeah, I I I think it's her, her legacy is quite profound. Actually, one one of the things I loved most when I worked at Hever Castle, of course, famed for being her childhood home was watching school children come in, you know, in big groups for the first time and really getting fascinated by this period of history and particularly in Anne Boleyn. And she kind of, I mean, she she has this reputation, quite wrongly, um, of being this bewitching uh, individual. And they're, they're, of course, she was never charged with witchcraft, but in her own time, um, she was tarred with that brush, though not charged um, with that particular crime. But in a way, Anne does bewitch us. Once she gets under your skin, it's very difficult to get rid of her. And I think as a devoted fan of hers, my interest in her, I think, has matured. It's become more profound. I, I keep having a re renewed respect for her. And I think the more we go into those grey areas, actually, and recognise her amazing talents, but also her many faults, we see a much rounder and more relatable individual. This was not a, a saintly woman. This was not a, a sinner either. She was complex. She was messy. And I think that's why we love her. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... That is how I feel about her. I will I relate to her so much. Not get my head cut off, but I relate to <laughs> how she is. But you just mentioned about, you know, seeing school children at Heaver Castle. I got to go to Heaver this year, the second time in April. 
and I saw school kids and I was like, what the hell? Why could I not come here as a school kid? (laughs) Because that would have been my dream. I went to some museum in my local city and I was like, I would (laughs) love this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I'd love it, you know, if in a few years time we could have a real sort of national discussion about education because I think people are privileged to live in certain areas of the country and be exposed to certain types of history because of the location they're in. I'd love it if we could have a much more egalitarian approach to history, how we access history. Maybe uh, there needs to be something of a digital revolution for those who can't necessarily get to places. Maybe they get to experience it in a different way. But all I know is that my my first visit to Hever Castle, which was when I was a few weeks older than when I watched Anne of a Thousand Days. I think it was for my fifth birthday, actually. Yeah, it had a lasting effect on me. Um, and I, I probably will be going there when I'm uh, a death door. So, um, yeah, it's really important. They, they uh, Experiences like that can be pivotal in people's lives, especially if you're a, a natural-born geek. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I first went to Hever six years ago now with my mum, auntie, and I... I loved Anne Boleyn by this point, but actually being able to walk in her footsteps, I was like, this is what I, this is what I want to do. This is yeah. me. Like, I'll just stay here. <laughs> you can all go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be fine. But no, Absolutely. Heaver Castle, if any listeners have not been, you, you need to go if you can, because it is a dream. It re- really, really is. And there's some, you know, it, it can it can be in better hands with Kate McCaffrey and Alison Palmer, who are doing amazing things um, uh, there at the moment. So there's really exciting things coming up, uh, which they'll be announcing soon. So, yeah, it, it's a very exciting time at Heaver. And I'm delighted to still live very nearby and to, to pop there regularly. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of listeners probably know you best from working at Heaver, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I was there for six years and I count myself as one of the luckiest people on the face of the earth getting to to work at a place like that. So, yeah, it's a a very beloved place of mine. It has been for a very, very young age. Yeah. I mean, when you announced it on Twitter, like listeners are probably like, what is she on about? But I I was in Nando's. I I think I messaged you like, why are you doing this? (laughs) What's what's (laughs) going on? I'm just in Nando's and my partner's like, what, 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 what's up? And I'm like, nothing, nothing, nothing nothing's up. He's like, what Tudor news has happened now? <laughs> like, <laughs> what's happened? like, nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, you are going to do amazing things whatsoever. Like, you don't need to be at Heaver, but I was like, oh, <laughs> I've only been there once when he worked there. What the hell? <laughs> No, it's, you know, I, I will always be devoted to Heaver. I, I visit it regularly now. But yeah, I, um, I, I sort of enacted the change that I really wanted to enact there. And I was able to um, realise a lot of, of my ambitions with Kate and Alison, who are amazing to work with. But I also, um, unbeknownst to a lot of people who only own, only knew me through Heaver, have a burning love for 20th century history as well Mm. um so i actually specialize in 20th century history um for my doctoral thesis um so i've been longing to to publish that thesis um which i've had to put on hold for the past six years because of being (laughs) Heva. uh Heva was an all-encompassing sort of role it was a sort of role that you had to take home with you so yeah i've got i've got four four other books that I'm working on um that have, I, I just had no time to to dedicate uh whilst working at Heva. So whilst it was a, a very difficult decision, it was definitely the right one for me at the time. I can't discount the possibility of going back at some point. Um uh but for now I I, I desperately want to focus on the things that I, I'm desperate to write about. So yeah. No yeah you absolutely should you've you, Kate McCaffrey and Dr. Nicola Tallis have launched the Tudor Trio, which is one Indeed, of the yeah. many things you are doing now you've left Eva, which is yeah. listeners haven't signed up, you need to sign up because there's some really good content already. 
quite yeah, we we at the we're, moment. <laughs> it came out. It. Oh, we're we're having such a such fun. Nicola Tallis, uh, Doctor Nicola Tallis, is a a dear dear friend, both Kate and mine. Um, so being able to do this project with her is a dream come true. Um, I'm also working very closely with my dear friend Natalie Gruniger. Still get to work with Claire Ridgeway. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm also doing a lot of my own writing um, at present. So yeah, I'm keeping keeping really busy, and I, I was so happy to sort of put those ambitions to one side to try and bring Anne to the fore at Heaver mm. a bit more. And I definitely think we've accomplished that. So yeah, I think I've I've done my duty to to Anne at Heaver, and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to what's next. No, yeah, you absolutely have. As I say, I've been to Heaver twice. Hopefully, a third time will be soon. And when I first went, it was completely different to when I came this year. I could tell the change you have all done to Heaver. You know, it felt like I am in Anne Boleyn's home, whereas the first time it just felt like a stately home a little bit. Yeah. And I was like, thank you to Owen, Kate, Alice, or whoever's been here, because this is amazing. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, we're, we're so lucky that um, for much of Heaver's history, it it really hasn't changed a huge amount. There's sort of a, a later veneer that was put on it by William Wardorf Astor, but he never really changed the layout of the castle. So the original rooms are still there. So, yeah, yeah I mean, you can't get closer to Amberlin than a Heaver. So uh, I'm thrilled to to hear that you noticed a, a difference. That's great. No, yeah, absolutely. I went with my friend this year and she was like, She's not a history nerd whatsoever, so she had to put up with a lot when I got to Heave Castle this year. Because <laughs> I was like, Heave, 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 Heave. <laughs> like, I did not care about anything else on that trip. And when she got there, she understood it. She was like, this is beautiful. And I was like, thank you. Yeah. Ah, that's, <laughs> thank that's lovely. You. you know, we we wanted everyone to be able to enjoy it. And, you know, of course, natural, natural fans of Heaver are going to be those who are interested in Anne's story but there are other stories that are really important from Heaver's history too and we definitely wanted to highlight those as well as doing Anne and her family justice so glad to hear that you liked <laughs> your friend did too that's fab my friend will be happy that she was mentioned in that as well absolutely <laughs> so before I let you go because I have kept a lot of your time to be fair oh, it's been um, a pleasure I thought it could be a little bit more informal and talk Tudor pet peeves. You've ah. mentioned one already. <laughs> um, I, I have mentioned on to a lot of people, my Tudor pet peeves are when someone watches like a TV show or a film and they then say they're an expert. It really bothers me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm an expert, that. but it's like, <laughs> okay. Do you know, it's really funny. Um, I, I love historical fiction and I love historical drama and the older I get the less annoyed I get at historical inaccuracy in them and actually I think this is a benefit of having worked in heritage um but everyone sort of I think does get annoyed by historical accuracy to a degree but I, I do see it as a learning opportunity and for a lot of people they will just want the the drama, the fiction, and that's all they're interested in. And do you know what? That's fine. Um, but a huge percentage of the questions that we would get every day was, is this what I've seen true? Or how is it different? And actually, they're, they're really great pivot points. They're really interesting ways in. And they they create the, the most interesting kind of discussions. The best conversations that I've had at Heaver have been rooted in some misconception that's been peddled by fiction or, or historical drama, you know. So that actually isn't one of my pet peeves. I, I don't mind it. I see it as an opportunity um, to have really interesting discussions. Um, what is one of my pet peeves? Gosh, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I suppose, actually, it's, it's when people get a bit moralistic about historical fiction because i've always consumed historical fiction alongside historical works and in a way i'm a bit envious of the novelists because they do get to speculate in a way that historians just can't mm. um and it always fascinates me 
you know, whenever I read um, Hilary Mantel, I'm thinking, my God, that I, you know, I wish I had the ability to um, make that assumption. But that is one of the prerogatives of being a novelist and, and writing historical drama. So I'm I'm going to use my my platform here to to stand up for historical fiction and recognize it as an opportunity to talk because I think that's the best solution to anything is having a good chit chat yes absolutely I love historical fiction it it is an escape and yeah I think if you don't see past if you ignore the inaccuracies I think you can enjoy it yeah definitely so definitely so I mean definitely. have you got her favorite historical fiction oh my god so much so much you know, obviously, I love Anne of the Thousand Days. Now, OK, from a historian's perspective, everyone always gravitates to Anne of the Thousand Days as perhaps the, the most authentic and the most true to the story. I actually think it's one of the most inaccurate. There, there are so many um, problems with this film. I still love it. I adore it. In fact, I've got about four posters um, <laughs> from the time up in my office. But. It, it very interesting. It, I find it very interesting. I was talking to this with Professor Suna, Susanna Lipscomb, and she was talking about how problematic Out of the Thousand Days is, and it really is. <laughs> and th- there's there's very little like historical truth to the narrative that they build. Um, but it, I suppose it's just done in a very convincing kind of way. So yeah, I mean, I I love Out of the Thousand Days. I love A Man for Seasons. I'm devoted to Hilary Mantel's. Warfall trilogy I think is just amazing I'm actually very very privileged to be attending the Warfall weekend um, which I'd encourage your visitors to google it's in the summer next year down in um, Devon from where Hilary Mantel uh, lived and it's a, a weekend celebration of of those wonderful novels and of Hilary too so yeah they're 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 my faves definitely oh yeah absolutely I Anna the Thousand Days is kind of one of those where you're like, no, but it, it it's just so beautiful. It's fine. Yeah. Just, leave, just leave it. Good. I mean, a, good. a Man for All Seasons as well. Like, my mum grew up on them and we watched it like when we're feeling a bit low. We're like, shall we just put on Anna the Thousand Days? Shall, yeah. shall, shall we just do it? So we've talked about historical fiction, but I was wondering mm. if you had any Tudor book recommendations or even Anne Boleyn ones. Oh my God, so many. <laughs> But I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend recent ones. Yes. There are, you know, there there are all the famous ones, Ives, etc. Natalie Gruniger's The Last Year of Anne Boleyn. I think everyone should read that. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It came out this year. Um and it really deserves um to be read widely because it's brilliant. Natalie left no stone unturned, and it's quite magnificent, actually. Um the second one. So Dr. Tracy Borman's very recently published uh, book on Elizabeth and Anne Boleyn, The Daughters Who Changed History, is just beautifully breathtaking. It's such an important book and it means a great deal to me personally. Um, So that is one that I would recommend heartily. I also want to recommend a book that is forthcoming. It's not coming out till next year, uh, but it's Dr. Nicola Tallis's Uh, study of the early life of Elizabeth. I'm just about to write an endorsement for this book and I actually read it in a day. I could not put it down. It has completely transformed how I see Elizabeth's early years and it is phenomenal. And what all of these books have in common, that which Natalie wrote, that which um, Nicola and Tracy have written, is a refusal not to go back to those original sources. They really did leave no stone unturned, questioned how we knew about claims that have been previously made, and they've they've come up with a very unique perspective um, for their efforts, and I highly recommend them. Lastly, I'd love to recommend the work of Claire Ridgway, uh, my dear friend and brilliant historian, she has a number of books on Anne Boleyn. Um, my favourite one is her book on Anne's downfall. You can buy her Anne Boleyn collection and the downfall book on Amazon. Highly recommend uh, all of them. Her contribution to Anne's scholarship is enormous. The establishment of the Anne Boleyn files has been so influential over the past 
decade or so so yeah I'd, I'd highly highly recommend her work they are amazing book recommendations and I wish I could say oh yeah I've not got them but I have got them. <laughs> I've got them Natalie Gruniger's book was fantastic but... I it was kind of one of those when you're like I didn't realize that quite much especially when it came to Henry VIII's jousting accident I kind of totally believed the media where it was you know everyone was in and then I read that and I was like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. what the amazing. Hell? amazing, amazing work. She's so talented. She really is. And uh, I, I highly recommend her her study of Anne's last year. It's just brilliant. Really no, is. Absolutely. Before I let you go, I have one more question. And it's sure. what myth would you like to debunk on Anne Boleyn? Oh, oh gosh, that's a really good question. I can't I I cannot think there are so many myths about Anne Boleyn. I think th- I'm kind of reluctant to debunk any of them in a way because that's kind of our livelihood, isn't it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> but if I could root one thing in people's mind is that she mattered, yeah. that she was a woman of incredible intelligence, uh, in- intelligence, wit, uh, charisma and courage. It's not as frequent now that people think she is a woman of insignificance, someone that Henry just fancied and then discarded and mattered. What happened to her also mattered. And I'm kind of thrilled that that version of Anne Boleyn is becoming less and less frequent. But we shouldn't assume that progress is a given. I'd hate for the advances that we have seen towards women's history, towards women's rights, go backwards. And I would hate to see Anne return to that stereotype alongside women today. So I I almost think that studying her life is part of that activism in a way. You, we kind of constantly have to fight to recognise women for who who they are so yeah that that's i th- i think what what i would like people to re- to recognize that she she really really mattered and that she is worthy of our time that is beautifully put and i think it's a really nice way to end the second episode of my podcast oh it's it's a, it's a r- real honor to be on your podcast at all uh let alone the second up so i'm i'm so so very happy you've you've done me the greatest honor um a lot of people were like how do you do that i was like not a clue (laughs) you have to you just you just have to ask you know yeah i've definitely adopted that i've definitely (laughs) adopted that i'm like you know i'm just gonna ask and risk it and fingers crossed they don't think i'm too weird (laughs) no not at all it's uh it's a lovely community and i've i've really discovered that it's actually quite a small community and we all rely on each other so yeah it's um what we do 